Okay, hey guys, so this is going to be a real quick overview of all the topics from chapters four, five, and six that you'll probably encounter or need to know for uh, exam two. You already went over most of chapter four for exam one, but we're just going to do a quick review anyway because it doesn't hurt. So starting with chapter four, um, let's start off with velocity fields. What they do is they, uh, they give us the velocity, the velocity vector at any point in space and time. So you can represent a velocity field using a vector field. Um, usually in fluids, you're going to see your vector field representation in two forms. You've got your Cartesian form and your polar form. So the Cartesian vector will look something like, you know, u is a function of x, y, z, and time. The same with v and the same with w. And that, those three dots just mean it's the same components as for the uh, x, x component of velocity. A uh, quick thing to note is that w is going to be equal to zero for 2D flow. In polar coordinates, you're going to have to convert it uh, between Cartesian and polar yourself. You can use the fact that u squared plus v squared is equal to r squared, or you know x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared, and then tan of theta is equal to v over u. So um, when taking magnitudes of your vector fields, so the magnitude of your velocity vector v is going to be equal to the square root of v dotted with itself. Uh, and you can use vector fields interchangeably with visualizations. So if you have a picture of a vector field, you can try and figure out what uh, the appropriate equations would be. If you have the equations for a vector field, you can visualize it. We've also got our Eulerian and Lagrangian descriptions of flow. So Eulerian uh, views use the field concept. So it's based off of location. And you've got Lagrangian mechanics, which follow your individual particles as they move. So there's also the concept, yeah. You've got the concept of streamlines. Every streamline is going to be tangent to your velocity vector, and you're going to have fixed lines for steady flow. So tangent to velocity and fixed lines for steady flow. Um, the path line is a bit, it's, it's, it's similar, but it's more Lagrangian based. The path line is a line traced by a single particle. And I'll just write it in Lagrangian. You've also got streak lines. Um, and it's, a, streak lines like an experimental superposition of all the path lines through a uh, common point. So it's like all the flows that end up going through there. So I'll say experimental. Uh, you have a special case when your flow is steady. Uh, for steady flow, your path lines, your streamlines, and your streak lines will all be the same. So path. This should all mostly be review of stuff you've already went over. We can interchange between your velocity field and your streamlines using the following relation. 
So with your velocity field defined as follows, u i plus, and this is for 2D flow, you can exchange it to a uh, streamlined function saying that d y over dx is equal to v over u. OK, so we're going to continue on. Uh, the next thing we're going to cover is the material derivative. Material derivative. Uh, and this is for your Eulerian view. And you know what? Heck, we'll just talk about acceleration too. So your acceleration vector, A of t, is going to be equal to the material derivative of your velocity. So you've got the derivative with vel of velocity with respect to time and plus all the component velocities. So u times the derivative with respect to x plus v And then you can also transfer this into just you know looking through the basic components. If you're looking for the x, y, or z components, you can just sub in your u velocity, v, or w instead of your v vector. So for example, your x direction of acceleration will be the material derivative of u with respect to t. Similarly, the acceleration in the y direction is the material derivative of the v component with respect to t, and so on. So if you have steady flow, then what's going to happen is you're going to have your material derivative with respect, or you're going to have your derivative uh, with respect to time term in your material derivative go to zero. So your overall material derivative is going to be of the following uh, format. You've got whatever function you're taking the material derivative of, f, with respect to time, and that's going to be equal to the partial of f with respect to time plus the same component derivatives that we, or that's meant to be x, the same component derivatives that we found earlier. You could rewrite this in shorthand notation as partial f of partial t plus your velocity vector dotted with gradient of f. And this material derivative can be applied to all sorts of uh, quantities. It could apply to acceleration, a temperature gradient, anything. Um, next thing we're going to cover is the Reynolds transport theorem. So and which is kind of a pain to write out. So I'm just going to write RTT. So the notation that I'm going to use here is that B, capital B, is any extensive property. Uh, and we can, we can convert this extensive property to an intensive property by saying that little b, our intensive property, is equal to big B divided by m. OK, so we've, we'll go over two cases. We've got a planar surface case, and we're going to go over the general case. So for a planar surface, we've got our material derivative of b of d t is equal to material derivative of b over your control volume dt plus the rate of b out minus b in. Whatever your property b happens to be. Uh, and you could rewrite this. This is going to be equal to your partial with respect to t of this super long integral uh, rho b V, that's going to be your derivative with respect to volume. I'm writing across the here so you don't confuse it with velocity. OK, so these two terms here, this is your uh, B flow out of control volume. And this is your B flow into your control volume. You've also got your general case when your surface is not planar, where your material derivative would be for your system. Oh, this should have a system underneath it, sorry. 
with respect to time is going to be the partial with respect to time of this huge integral, the control volume, rho, your intensive property B with respect to your volume, plus an integral over your control surface of rho times your velocity vector dot your normal times dA. Um, and remember that, so your n hat vector is always going to be normal to your control surface wherever you're going to take your integral. You can also note that v dot n is going to be your outward component anywhere on your surface. Okay. So basically what the Reynolds transport theorem does is it allows us to take our system properties and uh, extrapolate it down to our control volume. So going over once again, or just to make it very clear, you guys have probably gone over this in class. So intensive properties are going to be independent. Uh, that's what that double upside down pi sort of thing means. It's going to be independent of your system size. So it's like, that's why we're dividing our extensive property B, big B by our mass. And your extensive properties are going to be proportional to your system size. An example of this would be something like, um, pressure, energy, I would suppose. Uh, and then you can write that B cis is going to be equal to your integral over all your volume, your density, times little b, with, oh, with respect to your volume. Cool. I think that's about it for chapter four. Moving on to chapter five. So what we just went over is that your Reynolds transport theorem converts system level properties to control volume relationships. So RTT converts system level properties to control volume relationships. Um, and there's a couple important equations from that we can derive using the Reynolds transport theorem. So let's start off with, let's take we're going to take our conservation mass equation and use that to get our continuity equation. Um, and once again, so B is just equal to uh, M times little b, which means that little b is equal to big B over M. Okay. So if we take our material derivative of our mass of the system, with respect to time, that's equal to that derivative that we saw before, d over dt, time of the integral over the control volume, rho dv, plus your integral over your control surface, rho is v dot n hat dA, and that's going to equal zero. Um, and we should know here is that for steady flow, the partial of m with respect to t is going to be zero. Okay, next, we can use the Reynolds transport theorem on Newton's second law to derive our linear momentum equation. So we're gonna start off with Newton's second law, get our linear momentum equation. Uh, just quick review, you've all taken physics one and two presumably, but f is equal to ma which is equal to the partial respect to time of mv. In this case, our big B is going to be f times v, which means that our little b is going to just be our, our velocity. So taking the, um, applying the Reynolds transport theorem here, we get the following equation, partial with respect to time of our integral over our control volume, of rho, in this case, our little b is v, times dv uh -huh, plus the integral of our control surface of rho v times v dot n dA is equal to the sum of forces on our control volume. Uh, another quick thing to remember, remember if it's at steady state, any derivative with respect to time is just going to be zero. So zero 
if steady. Um, something that I've noticed that was a bit confusing on one of these last homeworks was taking into a consideration this v dot n hat term. This is going to be less than or equal to zero for flow into your control volume. And it'll be greater than or equal to zero for flow out of control volume. And remember, you have to take into consideration vectors twice. There's, you've got a vector for your velocity as well as your v dot n term. Uh, for more, for I guess a, a more in-depth explanation on this, I think two homeworks ago we had a problem where you had a really weird shape tube and you had a flow coming out at some angle. I would review the solution to that. Uh, we can simplify this in the case that we have uniform flow. It's just our simple integral of a control surface, rho v times v dot n hat dA, which is equal to our velocity out, our mass flow out minus our velocity in, times the mass flow rate in. Okay. Um, another situation which we can get something by applying the Reynolds transport theorem to something we already know is the energy equation. So if we take our conservation of energy expression and apply it RTT, we'll get our energy equation. So in this case, our little b, our intensive property is going to be our e. e in this case is energy density. It's going to be equal to u plus v squared over two plus gc. Uh, and you can think of u is just going to be your internal energy per mass. V squared over two represents your kinetic energy per mass and gz represents your potential energy per mass. And you can see that if we add the mass terms back in, it's you know the same formulas that you've already, that you already know and love for kinetic and potential energy. So applying the Reynolds transport theorem in, we have partial with respect to T over the control volume of our energy density, oops, energy density times our regular density with respect to volume plus our integral over control surface of rho times our velocity v dot n hat. Am I doing it? No, I'm not, sorry. This is going to be our integral of our control surface of u. So that's our internal energy per mass plus p over rho plus v squared over two plus g c times rho times your velocity vector dot n hat dA. So, and this is going to be equal to our net flux Q net in plus our shaft work, W shaft. Once again, this term, the material derivative, or the derivative with respect to time, this will be zero if steady. And for the second term over here, if your pressure velocity, so if pressure, velocity, and uh, your height z are uniformly distributed across one inlet and one outlet, so uniform, We can simplify this to the following expression. We have u plus p over rho plus v squared over two plus gc, and this is gonna be whatever is coming out, times our m mass flow rate out minus this entire quantity, u plus p over rho plus v squared over two plus gc in times your mass in. Okay, um, we've got a simple form. The change in pressure divided by your density plus one half, the change in velocity squared plus g times your change in height is equal to w shaft. And notice that I didn't put a dot on this case. In this case, this is equal to our w shaft dot over m m dot minus delta u minus q in, where our little q in is equal to 
big Q dot net in of our mass flow rate. And this is going to be your loss. Okay. Uh, for your Reynolds transport theorem, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to choose your coordinate system, you're going to have to choose your control volume, and you're always going to have to have flow perpendicular to your surface. Um, let's move on to the continuity equation. So the general form of the continuity equation is we have the partial with respect to time of the integral of the control volume, your rho times your change in volume, plus the integral of your control surface of rho v hat n hat dA. And that's gonna be equal to zero. Um, you're basically saying that zero is equal to your mass out minus your mass in. And note that if incompressible, rho doesn't change. There's a question on a, I think it was two or three homeworks ago, where you had a tube and you had a compressible gas at two different temperatures. In cases like that, you can't say that your fluid's incompressible. Your density will change with temperature. So if it's a gas, you could probably use the uh, ideal gas law, like we did in the homework, to try and derive what your, de what your densities are going to be at each point. Once again, uh, if we have steady flow, we can simplify the following expression. This will become zero. And you end up just with your integral over your control surface of rho v dot n hat dA being equal to zero. We can further simplify this, which we'd love to do. If we have a uniform velocity profile, if we have our uniform velocity profile, we can just write rho v2 a2 minus rho v1 a1 is equal to zero. This is saying my mass in is equal to my mass out. Let's go over the linear momentum equation. Okay, so to get through our momentum flow, our linear momentum equation, we're going to need to look at our momentum flow integral. So momentum flow integral. We want to compare our input to our output. So what ends up happening is you have your integral over your control surface of rho v times v dot n hat dA. And that's going to be equal to your velocity out times your mass out minus your velocity in, oh, minus your velocity in times n in. I think these should have hats or dots, maybe, for uniform flow. Okay. We also need to take into account the direction of our flow with respect to our coordinate system. So direction of flow with respect to our coordinate system. So what you have to remember is that your normal vector n hat is always going to be perpendicular to control surface. So n always perpendicular to Cs. Which means that if you have your, if you're comparing your v dot n hat term, this, oh, this is going to be greater or less, less than or equal to zero for flow into your control volume. It will be greater than or equal to zero for flow out of it. Uh, you also have to consider all your external forces acting on your CV. So let's go over some things that could cause that. External forces acting on CV. So you've got uh, one would be pressure over an area. You've got weight. You've got um, Let's call them reactive forces. So you, what you have to do is, if, if you're given a problem with a control volume, for example, um, I have a pipe strung up to a wall, there's flow inside, there's a force being applied in one direction, I need to know how much force I need for a bracket to keep it still. You have to remember that forces are vectors. You have to keep track of all the different components and signs. 
So keep track components and signs. Um, remember, uh, another quick trick is that if your flow is perpendicular to control surface at the exit, so if flow is perpendicular to control surface at entry slash exit, your only F, your only forces are going to be from pressure. A uh, quick way to think about this is just if I have some sort of pipe like that, and I have, you know, this is this is my control surface bounding my pipe right there. I have some external flow going directly against it. None of that flow is actually entering the pipe or entering the control surface. The only pre, uh, the only forces that are going to be affecting it from that flow would be any changes in pressure that it induces. Okay, um, let's keep going. In chapter five, we also have to go over the energy equation. So with your energy equation, you can start off with your energy flux integral. Uh, I'm really sorry, I might be going a little fast right now, but I have to cover all this in my, uh, in my small office hours span. So feel free to rewind as necessary. You've got your integral over your control surface of that quantity we were looking at before, your energy density plus pressure divided by density plus V squared over two plus GC times your density times velocity times dot with your normal vector, dA. That's equal to your net flux in plus your, your shaft work. Okay. For your energy equation, we have these things called loss and shaft work, where your shaft work is going to be equal to your rate of shaft work, or this W shaft term is just power. It's just a, a rate of energy divided by your mass flow rate m. Your loss is going to be equal to your delta U minus Q in, where Q in, little q is equal to your big flux divided by your mass flow rate. A quick note about this big integral over here. If your um, so if your pressure pressure velocity height are uniform throughout your one inlet and one outlet, you can go over that equation that we went over on the previous page. So uh, we can also note that the simplified form of your energy equation represents, it, it resembles your Bernoulli equation. So simplified So this, when I say simplified form, I'm referring to the form that's 1D flow. It's incompressible. You've got steady, uniform flow pro profile. And you've also got one input, one inlet, one outlet. Special thing about this case is that we know that our mass in, our mass rate in is equal to our mass rate out, which is equal to just m dot. So we can use that further. So what would this be simplified? Delta P over rho plus one half delta V squared plus G delta Z is going to equal your work shaft minus your delta U minus Q in. And further simplifying this, instead of deltas, we can just write our changes out. We've got pressure out over density plus V out squared over two plus GZ out is equal to our pressure in over density plus our velocity in squared over two plus GZ in plus our shaft work minus our loss. 
All right. And now let's go over chapter six. Okay. So first thing we covered in chapter six was kinematics. Um, just as a quick reminder, in, in chapter six, we started dealing a lot more with switching between our Cartesian and polar coordinates. So I'm just gonna write out our velocity vector in both forms. So we've got in Cartesian coordinates, our velocity is equal to u equals i hat plus v j hat plus w k hat as our velocity field. And in polar, that's going to be equal to our radial component velocity times our unit vector in the radial direction. That's what that er hat is, plus our theta component velocity with e times e theta hat plus our, our z component of velocity times our unit vector in z direction. Okay, so we went over two types of motion. We have translation and rotation. So with translation, what I've got is I have some particle and a little time later, it's moved to a different space. We've got rotation where I start off with this particle and a little later, it's rotated. Uh, what else? We've got linear deformation where I'm gonna start off with like a squarish particle and they'll turn to a squished rectangular one. Another name for this would be dilation. And we've got angular deformation. We start off with our square particle, and what we're going to do is we're going to stretch it this way. It's going to end up looking like a, like a little diamond. Um, we've got, you can relate these transformations to the partial derivatives of velocity. So partial derivative to, derivatives of velocity are related to trans deformations. So for example, linear deformation you can use your du df. You're going to take the derivative of each component velocity with respect to whatever direction that component's meant to be in. So you'll use partial u partial x, partial v partial y, and partial w partial z. For angular deformation, You're going to flip what you're taking the uh, components derivative with respect to. So, for example, the u would be respect to dy since u is our x component of velocity and y is the y direction. So, you du dy as well as dv dx. Um, we can go over our condition for incompressible fluid. So for a fluid to be incompressible, you want the gradient of the velocity field to be equal to zero. This tells us which fields are okay for incompressible fluids. And we got this from conservation mass. Uh, our continuity equation, we can have in our differential form as well. So def differential, continuity equation. Got your derivative density with respect to time. That's your derivative of your density times your x velocity with respect to x plus d rho v y plus partial rho w over dc. And you want that to equal zero. Another way to rewrite this is just partial density with respect to time, that's your transient term, plus the gradient of rho v dot, and you want that to equal zero. Note here that if your flow is incompressible, if your fluid's incompressible, and your uh, density rho is gonna be constant, which means that when you take your gradient with respect to v, 
to be zero. Or another way to rewrite that would just be, you know, your partial u, partial x. Um, sorry, if you're, uh, if rho is constant, you can just take it out of this equation. That's what I meant. So you just have to do your gradient of velocity. So partial u, partial x plus partial v, partial y plus partial w, partial z is equal to zero. The density is just going to cancel out. Um, once again, just going to hammer this home for any sort of steady flow, your transient term, your any, any derivative with respect to t is going to be zero. So zero if steady. And then you want your gradient. All you want is your gradient of your density times your velocity field to be zero. Uh, we This was the form of the differential continuity equation in Cartesian coordinates. We can go over polar coordinates as well. So in polar coordinates, your equation is 1 over r times the partial of r times vr plus 1 over r dv theta over d theta or d theta plus partial velocity of z with respect to z. And that's going to equal to zero. And in this case, I'm assuming that this is a steady state flow. We don't have a transient term. So we've got, what else do we have? We've got our angular rotation rate. Which would just be W or omega and your vorticity, which is going to be this weird symbol, which is equal to two times omega. I should make that more curly, two times omega, which is equal to your curl of your velocity field. Uh, and this is what you would think of for spinning particles, spinning particles in your flow. So if you have two times your omega equaling zero, then it's irrotational. And if two times omega is not zero, then you have rotation in the flow. You, uh, we've defined our net rotation vector using that curl, but we've also got a special name for it. So net rotation is just this weird little symbol, sub z, and it's equal to your cross derivative. So partial v with respect to x minus partial u with respect to y for a 2D field. Um, you can compare shearing strain and rotation. So shearing strain versus rotation. Just as a reminder, shearing strain is when we start off with a particle like that and it ends up looking more like that. Oh. Really stretched out. Um, and then rotation is going to be you start off with your particle like this and it you know, just, kind of, just kind of spins a little bit. So the expression for your shearing strain, the symbol that we use is gamma dot. That's partial v over partial x plus partial u over partial y. And then your rotation is that another that little weird symbol. And just to, just to indicate that we're only going to apply this to 2D flow, 2D c is equal to partial v over partial x minus partial u over partial y. <coughs> So let's go over two cases for each of these. So case one, we've got partial v or partial v or partial x is equal to partial u over partial y. And that means that your shearing strain is non-zero. Case two, partial v over partial x is equal to negative partial u, partial y, which means that your shearing strain is zero. Uh, and the equivalent cases in this case for rotation would be that uh, so your rotation vector, if you have your partial of your derivative with respect to x of e equal to your derivative of u with respect to y, uh, in this case, it would be irrotational. 
And this is what we call pure dilation. Where all that's happening is we're just stretching this particle out. If we have partial v partial x equal to negative partial u partial y, our rotation vector is going to not be zero, which means this is rotation. And this is the case that we call pure rotation. There's no stretching of the particle at all. All we're doing is spinning it in place. Um, so just to summarize all these different types of flow that you've been learning about, let's just go over them really quickly. So types of flow. I really hope this is capturing, capturing my sound. If it isn't, I'll be very sad. Okay. So we've got steady flow, where your derivative of your velocity with respect to time is equal to zero. Um, you've got your rotational. where your partial cross V is equal to zero. Um, for incompressible, you've got your conservation of mass. So for your partial uh, V is going to equal zero. You've got inviscid, uh, inviscid flow. Inviscid meaning that you have you know, viscosity or small tau, so a uniform velocity pro profile, uniform V profile. That should say viscosity. So for an inviscid flow, that stress tensor that we went over, we're gonna have tau ij is equal to zero. And then our stress on each face is going to be equal what? Okay, you probably, I'm not sure if you have to know that or not. Um, I don't think we did for our exam, but it's just good to know. We can define our velocity vectors for each dimension. If we have a 3D, 2D, or 1D flow. So for 3D, we have velocity vectors equal to ui hat plus vj hat plus wk hat. If it's 2D, our velocity vector is only equal to these first two components, ui hat plus vj hat. If it's 1D, we have a velocity equal to just ui hat. Okay, almost done. Last things that we're going to cover are stream, stream functions and potential functions. Okay, um, so we've got, just very quickly, I'm gonna go over what happens if your stream or potential function is constant. If your stream function is constant, that means that your streamlines are tangential to the velocity. If you have a constant potential function, that means you have equal potential lines. And this will, these are all gonna be perpendicular to your streamlines. Okay. So stream functions. And this is for the case of steady, incompressible, 2D flow. What we have in this case, we're gonna have our psi, which is our stream function. And I'm gonna go over what psi would be in both Cartesian and polar coordinates. So in Cartesian coordinates, you have the velocity is equal to ui plus vj, because we're only looking at the two-dimensional case. Based on your stream function, your x component velocity u is going to be your derivative of your stream function with respect to y. And your y component velocity v is going to be the negative derivative of your stream function with respect to x. Okay. If we're in polar coordinates, your velocity vector is defined as vr 
times your unit vector in your r direction. This one, I'm just going to call it r hat because it's easier to write. Plus your v theta times theta hat. These both mean the same thing as e sub r, e sub theta. They're just unit vectors in your r and theta directions. In this case, your v sub r term would be equal to one over r, one over r times your partial of psi with respect to theta. And your v sub theta term would be your negative partial of psi with respect to r. Um, when you integrate these functions, remember that if you're integrating with respect to uh, y, you're going to have some function of x as a constant at the end. If you're integrating with respect to x, you're going to have a function of y at the end. And vice versa, and you know, accordingly, so for your polar coordinates, this is probably stuff you went over in Calc three or Diffie Q. Okay. Uh, and as we just kind of vaguely touched on earlier, if you have lines of constant psi, those are streamlines. They're always tangential to your velocity vector. Okay. We've got our equations of motion as well. So we've got our stresses. I think this was the lecture that Hunter did. So sigma xx, tau xy. In this case, you're saying that the first, the first uh, coordinate is going to be the normal to the surface. So normal to surface, that's this x, this x. And then the direction of your stress is going to be given by the second letter here. So in this case, this is the stress on the x surface, on the x facing surface in the x direction. But this is going to be the shear stress on the x surface in the y direction. And remember that for this flow, the tau is equal to zero. And this is uh, just again, this means your viscosity is negligible, where you have a uniform V profile, or your sigma xx is only due to pressure. And in this case, what you're going to have is sigma xx is equal to sigma yy is equal to sigma zz, and that's equal to negative p. Your stresses on your surface are only going to be due to the pressure directly into that surface. We can look at our Euler equations for inviscid flow. And we can use that to interconvert between our Bernoulli's equations. Bernoulli's equations. And this is the requirements for using Bernoulli are that it's inviscid, steady, incompressible. Um, I think that was it. Pretty sure that was it. Okay. Maybe there was one. I'll leave it up. Uh, so you've got rho gx minus partial p over partial x. And that's going to be equal to your density times your material derivative of your x component velocity with respect to time. And you can do the same thing for your y direction. G, rho gy minus partial p partial y is equal to rho dt over dt. Same thing with your z direction. Rho gz minus partial p partial z is equal to rho dw dt. You can combine all these equations with this uh, vector form. So where rho g dot minus the gradient of p is equal to rho u dt. OK. And if we integrate this equation, that should be an integral. Uh, you want to see the details for this, you could see section 6.4.2 going to end up with your Bernoulli equation. So you've got p over rho plus v squared over 2 plus gz is equal to some constant. It'll, it'll be constant along a streamline. OK, we've gone over our stream functions. So let's go over potential flow now. So your potential flow is going to be 
defined by phi. And this is going to be for inviscid, incompressible, steady. Oh, actually, sorry. This is just your potential function. Potential flow is going to be inviscid, incompressible, steady, and irrotational. So we've got uh, common, we've got our common 2D planar potential function. If it's uniform, we have our phi is equal to fx. And taking the gradient of that, we'll get that u is equal to big U. V is equal to zero. And what this flow is going to look like is just you know straight uniform flow. In polar coordinates, we've got two special cases. We've got a source slash sink, in which case your phi, your potential is going to be equal to plus or minus m over two pi ln r, where if it's positive, there'll be a source, negative, there'll be a sink. And then m is going to be your flow rate. And this is going to look something like, you know, I've just got all my flow coming towards this direction here, and it's going to flow out because it's a sink. The other case for polar coordinates is a vortex, where you've got phi is equal to gamma, which is over 2 pi times theta. And what this is going to look like is you've got your axes over there, and it's just going to be all your flow is just going to be spinning around. Uh, gamma in this case is going to be your circulation. And if you have a positive gamma, gamma greater than zero, that means that your flow is going to be counterclockwise. The way to think about this is that, you know, when you're increasing an angle, you're going to go counterclockwise against your um, origin. The same, hand, the same uh, holds true for your gamma. Okay. Um, last part, we're going to be connecting or interrelating your velocity, your potential function, and your stream function. So we've got our Cartesian case, where your velocity vector is equal to ui plus bj. And you've got your polar case, where your velocity vector is equal to vr r hat plus v theta theta hat. In the Cartesian case, your u is going to be defined as your partial psi with respect to y. Your v is going to be defined as your negative partial psi with respect to x. And that's using you know, your string functions. Using your potential functions, you've got u is equal to partial phi, partial x, and v is equal to partial phi or partial y. Cool. Um, for your polar coordinates using our string functions, we get vr is equal to 1 over r d psi d theta. This is using our string function. v theta is going to be equal to negative d psi dr. And using our potential, we've got vr is equal to d phi or dr. And V theta is equal to one over R D phi over D theta. I think that about covers everything that I took notes on for when I took exam two. I hope that helped. Um, good luck on the exam.